This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're spending the hour with Spencer Ackerman, the Pulitzer Prize-winning national security reporter, author of Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump. Spencer, you begin your book um, with the prologue, with Timothy McVeigh visiting the far-right paramilitary compound in Elohim City, Oklahoma, before what you call the prologue's uh, chapter heading, the worst terrorist attack in American history. Talk about the connection you see between the rise of right-wing extremism in the United States and the so-called war on terror. I thought it was extremely important to see the war on terror in uh, its fullness, in its totality, and only then can we understand its implications. And I think the only way to really do that is to look at who were the exceptions to the war on terror, who the war on terror didn't target, uh, despite fundamentally similar actions. And there we can understand not just what the war on terror is, but its relationship to American history, which shapes it so deeply. And so I also wanted um, to kind of start with a journalistic cliché, uh, where the reporter kind of zoologically uh, takes a reader through this unfamiliar and scary world of violence uh, committed by fanatical people who are training with heavy weapons and talk about committing uh, mass atrocity. Uh, for a sick and supposedly divinely inspired religion. But I wanted those people to be white. I wanted the reader to see how similar uh, these actions were, how similar some of the motivations were, how similar some of the justifications were. Um, but we never treated them like that. Uh, the whole purpose of the phrase war on terror uh, was a kind of social compromise amongst respectable elites in order to not say the thing that they were, in fact, building, which was an expansive war only against some people's kinds of terror, only against non-white people's kinds of terror, only against foreigners' kinds of terror, and not against the kind of terrorism that is the oldest, most resilient, most violent and most historically rooted in American history, one that seeks to draw its own heritage out of the general American national heritage. Uh, people who call themselves not dissenters, not rebels, but patriots, people who are restoring something about America that they believe a, a corrupt elite that is now responsive to non-white power at the expense of uh, the extant racial caste that has been deeply woven inside not just the American political structure, but the American economy that drives American politics, how that ultimately never gets uh, treated. This is exactly what Timothy McVeigh uh, was about. This is what Timothy McVeigh uh, had as his motivations for murdering 168 Americans in Oklahoma City, including 19 children. And we looked away from it. We looked away uh, from how deep uh, the uh, rootedness of white supremacist violence was in this country. We, we listened to uh, what I believe are principled civil libertarian objections against an expansive category of uh, criminalized association uh, treating people who might have believed, as McVeigh did, odiously, as, as I believe that is, but ultimately not committing acts of violence, um, treating them as essentially indistinct from McVeigh was absolutely intolerable, as it always should have been um, to uh, the American political elites. But that intolerability did not extend to Muslims. And there it was easy after 9-11 to construct an apparatus fueled by things like the Patriot Act uh, that expanded enormous categories of criminal association known as material support for terrorism, authorized widespread surveillance that certainly would not uh, be focused simply even on American Muslims, as disgusting as it was that it was uh, focused on them uh, primarily. But ultimately, all of these things that uh, both parties 
that the leaders of the security services um, and intellectuals created, maintained, and justified so readily against the threat of a foreign menace seen as civilizational, um, seen as an acceptable substitute uh, for a geopolitical enemy that had served as a rallying purpose throughout the 20th century, um, the war on terror is kind of a zombie anti-communism in a lot of its political cast and association. And never would any of this be visited upon white people. From the start, the war on terror showed you exactly who it was going to leave out from its carceral, from its surveillance, and from its um, violent gaze. So I want to go to Donald Trump uh, this week, considering a 2024 challenge to President Biden. Said in a statement, Biden surrendered to the Taliban. Meanwhile, Republicans on the House Armed Services Committee demanded a plan from Biden to stop Afghanistan from becoming a, quote, safe haven for terror groups after the Taliban takeover. This is Republican Congressman Michael McCall on CNN. We are going to go back, Jake, to a pre-9-11 state, mm -hmm. a breeding ground for terrorism. And, you know, I hate to say this, I hope we don't have to go back there, but it will be a threat to the homeland so in a matter you, of time. You have the Republicans now talking about a uh, foreign terrorist threat. Um, the Republicans who have been denying the insurrection of January 6th, calling it, you know, it, no worse than a group of tourists coming to Washington, D.C., and not wanting to investigate that, even though under Bush, under Trump, um, the intelligence agencies have said the number one domestic terror threat is right-wing white supremacists. We see who the war on terror then is now uh, is a mechanism uh, for having terrorism excused, not terrorism dealt with. When that terrorism is white, when it is politically powerful, when for reasons that they themselves probably uh, ought better to explain, uh, politicians sympathize with it, seek to draw strength from it. That's a real serious red flag for American democracy. We don't have to treat it as if it is a new red flag for American democracy. This is always how American democracy has been eroded. This is always alongside the ways in which capital has been extremely willing to ally with white supremacy. This is what the creation of Jim Crow was. This is how the maintenance of segregation in uh, the north of the country, which we don't often talk about as much in its uh, different permutations. I'm a New Yorker. This city is segregated even still. Um, you see that definitely with the way the school system is constructed. Ultimately, we are seeing throughout this past week the ease with which the Republican parties, supposedly now in the Trump era, uh, and, you know, feeling antipathy to the war on terror, readily snap to war on terror politics when it comes to the demonization of refugees. The idea that America has a responsibility to take in the refugees that it itself creates out of this psychotic, racist fear of white replacement, that demographics are ultimately driving uh, the erosion of, you know, on, in its respectable settings, white political power, not just on the fringes, but at the centers of American governance. And that is a politics of the war on terror that has been here from the start. Trump makes it vastly less subtle, to the extent that it was subtle, than it was before. And his uh, hold on the party is not an accident. Uh, his, his hold here has everything to do with the way that he was able to recognize the ways in which the war on terror is an excellent sorting mechanism for uh, figuring out who is a real American and who is a conditional American. And then, as we saw him using the tools of the war on terror on the streets of cities like Portland and Washington, D.C., and New York, and you know, in the skies over many, you know, as many as 15 cities last summer, he's willing to use it on Americans that he calls terrorists. Spencer Ackerman, you write repeatedly about Adam Hassoun. Tell us his story. Amy, uh, I just want to thank you so much for asking about Adam. I, I knew you would. 
Uh, you have truly been one of uh, the journalistic heroes of this era. And uh, Adam Hassoun is a symbol of the ways that the war on terror criminalized people. Um, Adam Hassoun uh, is a Palestinian-born man uh, who survived. He grew up in the Lebanese Civil War of the 1980s um, and uh, immigrated to Florida um, in the 1990s. And uh, as a refugee himself uh, and an active participant uh, in his uh, community in, in Miami and South Florida and the Islamic community there, uh, he wrote a lot of checks to refugee charities, people that uh, he had thought were helping refugees and helping war victims in places like, like Bosnia, where the, the wars um, uh, became genocidal in the Balkans against uh, Balkan Muslims. And ultimately, uh, among the people that he met and tried to help was a convert named Jose Padilla. Jose Padilla would, after 9-11, uh, become uh, famous uh, as someone John Ashcroft accused of uh, trying to set off a radiological weapon inside the United States. And very shortly after that happened, Padilla was at first placed in military custody, an American citizen. That was allowed at the time. Uh, the feds came for Adam. And even though Adam had committed no violence, Adam had done nothing criminal, uh, the feds and immigration authorities locked him up, and they leaned on him to try and inform on his community, to try and be an informant. And he refused to do that. Uh, he considered it an affront to his dignity. He considered it unjust. And as a result, he spent a tremendous amount of time. He spent years in, uh, in jails in Florida while ultimately uh, the FBI and uh, the local prosecutor, uh, who would eventually be um, the Trump cabinet member Alex Acosta, came up with pretexts uh, to prosecute him. Uh, he was originally charged uh, as a co-defendant uh, with Jose Padilla, who is now placed in uh, federal custody. Um, and even though there was no way that the government could connect him uh, to any act of violence, the, thanks to the Patriot Act and thanks to, frankly, uh, the atmosphere politically uh, in the years after 9-11, that uh, he could be charged uh, with things that simply you know, were not acts of violence or acts of active um, contribution uh, to specific people committing specific acts of violence that the government could name. And he was convicted. And as he was sentenced, the judge reduced his sentence. The feds were seeking life for Adam because the judge recognized that the government couldn't point to any act that he, you know, act of violence that he was responsible for. Uh, that was in uh, 2007. He served until 2017 uh, in federal prison, a variety of federal prisons. And then in 2017, when he had finished his sentence, he had figured that he would be deported, that uh, ultimately he would go back to you know, probably Lebanon. He was kind of done, as you can imagine, with the United States at that point, but he didn't. What happened instead was that he was sent into ICE detention uh, in western New York, outside of Buffalo, at a place called Batavia. Uh, and after the Patriot Act became law in 2001, there was great civil libertarian fear over one of its provisions, Section 412. Section 412 said that any non-deportable non-citizen, which is to say a stateless person who doesn't have a country that will take that person in, uh, who is deemed a threat to national security uh, by the authorities, ultimately in this case the determination is made by the Secretary of Homeland Security, could be imprisoned indefinitely. That never happened throughout the whole war on terror until it was time to keep Adam Hassoun locked up. Ultimately, in uh, early 2020, around like late February, early March, Adam gets sick to the point where he, uh, we don't know for sure, but he thought that he got COVID. By uh, April of that year, uh, Batavia was the ICE uh, detention facility with the highest COVID outbreak inside. So here was a figure who the United States criminalized, robbed of his freedom, and then ultimately endangered his life uh, by the incompetence uh, and indifference that it showed uh, in allowing COVID to run wild in facilities filled with people that the United States functionally treated as non-people. And it took a very valiant effort by local attorneys and by the American Civil Liberties Union to challenge his detention. Um, ultimately, instead of outright losing uh, the case, as a judge indicated 
um, after she ruled Adam had to go free because the FBI admitted that We have 30 that it seconds, on Spencer. It. Sorry. Adam was ultimately successful once the government dropped its case in order to preserve its power to do this. And he lives in freedom, I'm happy to say, uh, right now in Rwanda. Uh, we have 30 seconds. What has surprised you most about what is happening today? Uh, very little at this point, I'm, I'm sorry to say, uh, surprises me. But uh, the general indifference uh, by the American political and intellectual elites to the relationship between the war on terror and the erosion of democracy is also a very deep thread and very historically rooted, not just in the war on terror, um, but before. And certainly seeing that those connections have to be made in order to have any form of real democracy in this country and safety and dignity for so many people.